good morning, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, I am, as was just said, Patrick Holden, uh, Director of the Sustainable Food Trust. Uh, I trained in biodynamic agriculture many years ago in the 1970s and started farming in West Wales, where I still farm. And between 1995 and 2010, I was uh, director of the Soil Association. And now I'm in the process of launching the, the new organization, which was just mentioned. Um, I want to talk about the challenge which is facing us in relation to our food systems. And the nature of that challenge is now uh, widely agreed upon. Um, the combination of climate change, resource depletion, the need to feed a global population which will peak at 10 billion against a backdrop of diminishing land area caused by the destruction of soil fertility but also um, desertification. And to do all that whilst at the same time addressing the huge challenge of uh, diminishing uh, natural resources and the loss of soil fertility is perhaps one of the greatest challenges that has ever faced mankind and yet we've got to do that uh, with relatively little public understanding of this, the seriousness of the challenge or the limited time available. Our current food systems are not for, fit for purpose. They are using non-renewable inputs and treating them as if they were um, um, income. So we're using up earth capital uh, at a frightening rate, especially fossil fuels, and also phosphate and potash and water. So we can't go on like that. The systems of food production are largely based on the use of nitrogen fertilizer which is responsible for huge emissions. It's estimated that of all emissions, uh, about 30, at least 30%, and some estimates are now up to 50%, are caused uh, from our food systems from plough to plate. The latest estimates are nearer 50% than 30%. And of that, around 50% is caused before the farm gate. Uh, and of that, 50% or thereabouts is likely to be connected with the manufacture and the use of nitrogen fertilizer. The manufacturing process uses a lot of natural gas and also is responsible for the emission of a lot of nitrous oxide, which is a potent greenhouse gas. And then when that nitrogen fertilizer is applied on the land, uh, more nitrous oxide is released. And because uh, nitrogen fertilizer uh, has the effect of oxidizing soil organic matter uh, there is a further release of carbon dioxide from the, um, from the erosion of the soil carbon bank, which is directly connected. And then we have high levels of pollution coming from farming systems, pesticides getting into water, pesticides getting into the food chain itself, and uh, other uh, un unsustainable practices. Our farming systems are also destroying the, uh, in agriculture, relying on fewer and fewer genes, both in the plants and in the animals. Um, the, there is a frightening reduction in genetic diversity happening with both um, the seeds that farmers sow, but also the number of um, lines of animals. And for instance, artificial insemination in uh, the cattle breeding world has caused a huge reduction in the gene pool. And this, just in, bio in biodiversity terms, is, is, is potentially very risky. And then um, the biggest threat, I think, is that there are fewer and fewer farmers, processors, packers, distributors, and retailers are handling an ever greater proportion of all the food we eat. Uh, these, these issues have been highlighted in a film which everyone should watch called Food Inc., an American film which came out in um, 2009, uh, which highlighted the fact that there's an ever-diminishing number of farmers responsible for more and more of the food we eat, and yet the public are lar largely ignorant of that uh, in to a considerable degree uh, because of the own labeling culture 
which has been adopted universally by supermarkets. So if you go into a supermarket today, you're confronted with the illusion of choice, a vast diversity of different brands. But if you try to find out the story behind the brand, you, uh, you, you can't find out who produced the food, where they lived, whether they had any decent relationship with the person who bought the product. Um, and in, in fact, it's likely, just to take one example, meat, that uh, the meat will have come from thousands of animals, all of which who will have been slaughtered at a single point abattoir and then packed in a single point meat plant and then distributed through a centralized distribution center. And this is all going on largely under the radar screen of public uh, awareness. And as a result of that, if there were sudden shocks to our food system caused by um, perhaps wars or climatic events or trade disputes uh, or um, a rapid, de uh, a big demand in another part of the world, our food systems are uniquely vulnerable uh, to letting us down. It's, there's a phrase, nine meals from anarchy. And if you look at the, uh, the highly centralized distribution system that I just referred to, the fact is uh, that if we had one of these sudden shocks, we could quite suddenly uh, be, be faced with a national food emergency. The last time that happened in the UK was during the Second World War, when we still had a uh, substantial lattice work of small-scale process farming, processing and distribution systems intact, and they uh, came to our aid. But since then, the centralization of our food systems has resulted in the disappearance of most of that small-scale infrastructure. So our food systems have little resilience against external shocks because of this disruption of what we all took for granted only 60 years ago. Against all that, there are encouraging signs of the emergence of a new food movement, of which I have been part, especially during my time as uh, director of the Soil Association, where initially a small group of us uh, built an alternative platform of production based on sustainable principles, and then we reached out to consumers and built the organic food market based on that approach. But for all the excellent work that the food movement has done in its many organizational guises, it's failed to break through into the mainstream. And if you were really generous and you added up the total of organic food and local food and all the sustainable food initiatives that exist in this country and indeed throughout the world, you would probably only total about 5% of the, of the total food market. And if anything, the systems that I just described to, the remorseless centralization and the trends towards fewer and fewer, larger and larger, more and more industrial, are still going in that direction. So. Why haven't we broken through? What's, what's the barrier to, to, uh, to this? Why hasn't the food movement able, been able to go further? Well, I think the answer is in part because we are um, those people who try to farm in a more sustainable way or consumers who buy cons sustainably produced food are making less profit if you're a farmer and if you're a consumer, you have to pay more and that is very off-putting. Why should it be that in this society where enlightened people ought to be acting responsibly to save the planet or to reverse the industrialization of agriculture, you make less profit by so doing and you pay more if you're a consumer. And the, the answer for that is what economists call the failure to internalize external costs. And that means that when you apply the fertilizer that I referred to earlier, there is an emission to the atmosphere but that's not paid for by the farmer or the fertilizer manufacturer. So when you farm intensively and you use a lot of nitrogen, uh, you get away with those, ex you, 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 the, because the uh, external costs are not internalized at source, in other words, the polluter isn't paying, uh, the food appears cheap, when in fact it not, it not only isn't cheap because of the, uh, the cost to emissions, but also the other collateral damage to uh, the environment and human health. And in the absence of a policy environment where the polluter pays and where incentives are uh, applied so that people who adopt responsible practice benefit from so doing, it is extremely unlikely that small-scale, sustainable, relocalized food systems uh, will break through into the mainstream. However, there is an example of where that has happened, and that is with renewable energy, where uh, the introduction of the feed-in tariffs made it profitable for small-scale renewable energy producers, more profitable uh, than the large guys. But what hasn't happened to date with food is what is happening with renewable energy. The problem with that is that if we were to, if David Cameron was here today listening to this argument, uh, he would say to the Chancellor, uh, what about that? And the Chancellor would say, 
No, we won't introduce those measures because they're inflationary. And the truth is that in the short term, if we were, if the polluter was to pay, and if the subsidies were to be transferred to incentivize sustainable production systems, uh, we would have to pay more for our food. Although it should be said that in the long term, governments and society as a whole would gain because we wouldn't be faced with cli irreversible climate change or the very large public health costs, which are arguably, I, I haven't made the connections, but there was, there was a public health time bomb in the pipeline, which is indirectly related to the sort of food systems we have. And we wouldn't, for instance, have to clean up the pesticides in the water and pay that through our water bills. So although there are political reasons why the government wouldn't, wouldn't want to take up these measures, um, they would, would in fact be beneficial in the long run. And that goes, there's, that's also reinforced by industry self-interest. There are lots of food companies who like the present system, which is essentially parasitic on the primary producer, making money, uh, dairy farmers being the most obvious recent example, where many, many thousands of dairy farmers, of which I am one, not yet gone out of business, but they are going out of business at a rapid rate. And that's because supermarkets are paying less than the cost of production for milk because milk is sold as a loss leader, a known value item in supermarkets, and they can get away with that because they can. And the dairy farmers are disappearing and no one seems to care. And that system uh, produces cheap food, which is politically attractive to a government in these times when inflation needs to be kept at a minimum. And due to the lack of public understanding of these issues, nothing changes. So, and what, what might it take um, to break through? What are the key characteristics of the food systems uh, that we need to replace the present system? Well, let's just start with the characteristics. We need to produce enough food and we need to do that using sustainable farming systems. If we were to switch to sustainable farming systems in the UK, for instance, we would, this would be a huge change of land use because if we look at the arable east, uh, most of the farms are continuous arable using nitrogen fertilizer. If they were to abandon nitrogen fertilizer, which is essential if we are to reduce uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, they would have to go back to rotational farming, building fertility through grass and clover, and then exploiting that fertility in the arable phase. This would result in a 50% reduction of our, our grain pr production in the UK, which sounds dramatic and worrying, but in fact, 50% of the grain that we produce is actually fed to intensively farmed livestock. So the direct consequences of adjusting our agriculture to deal with the emissions challenge would be we'd have to change our diets. We'd have to virtually stop eating intensively produced white meat but interestingly enough, and contrary to what a lot of people are thinking these days, red meat, sustainably produced forage-fed red meat, would form quite a central part of the diet because red meat will be an, uh, a byproduct uh, of the fertility building phase of these um, rotational farming systems which are needed to keep the land in good heart and keep the soil bank out, uh, carbon bank up. And in fact, the methane emissions from these animals would be more than offset by the carbon gains uh, from uh, the switch in farming systems. We also would need to minimize our, our use of non-renewable inputs and recycle uh, phosphate, potash, uh, and of course organic matter as much as possible. Some, uh, these, these haven't been a feature of uh, late 20th century and early 20th, 21st century farming systems. This would have to be addressed. And finally, we'd need to produce food of high quality, and ideally the staples in other words, the vegetables, the meat, the fresh dairy products, and the arable products, uh, which are the key components of our staple food, should be produced as close as possible to where we live, because that will increase the element of food security and move away from the globalized and um, vulnerable food systems uh, that I described earlier. Now, all that needs to be done, and I believe it can be done, and I'm saying that, drawing from my own experience as a farmer, because I've, been, I've had the privilege of having had a 39-year relationship with a, uh, a, a hill in West Wales, uh, which I uh, first, went, first occupied in uh, 1973, uh, and has been continuously farmed since then. And the farm, that's the, that's the farm building taken in January this year. Uh, we have on the farm a 70 cow dairy herd, it started at 30, which is interesting, so we've more than doubled the size of the herd. Uh, 
and we, uh, we have Ayrshire cows and we convert all the milk from those 70 Ayrshire cows into a single farm unpasteurized cheese. In fact, I, I might just run through the photographs because I'll then tell you what I, that's, that's, sorry, I go back there. That's my family. Uh, what have I done? I did. Okay. Oh, it's jumping all over the place. That's the clover of grass upon which the fu future fertility of the soil in temperate regions will depend because clover fixes nitrogen and a three to five year um, program of clover and grass building the soil fertility and producing food for cattle is the key to building soil fertility. And the soil carbon bank could increase by several percentage points if all the soils of the UK, for instance, were under, under that system, which would represent a larger carbon bank globally than even the rainforests. So this is something that we can do now and do quickly to reinstall some of the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere into the soil. This is cutting it for silage, uh, July last year, and tedding it. That's oats and peas. Uh, this is uh, our plan on our farm is to be as self-sufficient as possible uh, to build resilience. So, that, that so in a way, my farm is the cell of the larger food system. And it's my opinion that if you get the if you get the the small micro system right, then you can apply many of the things that you've learned at the macrocosmic level. So my idea, uh, echoing many of the things I've said, is could I develop a farming system which, whose key characteristics are resilience, sustainability, um, building soil fertility, minimum reliance on non-renewable external inputs, and minimal vulnerability to world markets and sudden interruptions of key inputs. So one of the things we're doing is we've, we've been feeding our dairy cows concentrate feed for many years, which has been purchased, but now we're switching to feeding oats and peas in place of the concentrate feed which most dairy farmers can, uh, depend on, and that's the 2011 crop. There it is on the 1st of September last year being combined, and from this year onwards will probably be about two-thirds of our um, concentrate dairy ration will come from the farm itself. And of course the byproduct is the straw, which you can see on the right. That last year we were completely self-sufficient in bedding, and if you ever go to Wales, in the winter, you'll see an endless succession of straw lorries on the A40 bringing straw from the Arab East into Wales, which is a really totally unsustainable practice. These are our dairy cows grazing clover and grass uh, last summer. Oh dear, I'm jumping around. There's our dairy cows coming in to be milked. There's the milking parlour, new to us, and a breast milking parlour, second hand actually from Rachel's Dairy, those of us those of you who eat Ye Rachel's Dairy uh, products, that's the old Rachel's Dairy uh, milking products. They went out of milk. Well, this is jumping around all over the place. I'm really sorry. I don't know if... Can I, can I be helped from the back with the sequence? I want to go back to the, the milking parlour shot. Yeah, that's it. And the next one after that. No. The cow's being milked, it should be. Yeah, that's it. There they are, being milked. I don't know what it is. Um, well, you've seen most of them. I think you've got the drift. Okay, I think that gives you an impression of what we're trying to do. And what it's, um, what it's given me is real deep confidence that it is possible over a period of time to build a resilient food system. Which, and the key observations that I've derived from this long-standing process 
is the number one critical factor which will be more important than any single other issue in the future of uh, food and farming in the world will be whether farmers can not only maintain soil fertility to, but, but to build it. Because without uh, increasing soil fertility, uh, the future for humanity looks rather bleak in the sense that we will not be able to feed uh, the peak population in a sustainable way. So really what we have to do, and this is not a question for the sustainable food movement of, of, of which I've been part, as I said, this is a, a challenge for the whole of community, uh, the human community, is to build systems of food production at, in all regions of the world which are able to maintain and build soil fertility. And the second thing that we have to do, and this is again my experience, is we have to build systems resilience into those production systems at a farm, local, regional, national and continental level. And of course if you live in London, the kinds of relocalization of the production distribution of key food commodities is going to look different from it is uh, in a tiny village or small community in West Wales. But you can see that even then the principle of proximity of the provision of key staple inputs to the source of consumption is important and we need to devise uh, systems of transportation where uh, those key staples can be uh, reliably transported uh, to the consumers, for instance in London. When we first went to Wales in 1973, there was a milk train which left West Wales every morning to go to London to take the milk from the dairy farms of West Wales. And of course the beaching cuts uh, got rid of the passenger service and they, that was, that's me and my son, the cheese maker. This is another key observation. Uh, I've just finished the, um, uh, the issue of the transportation. Uh, the milk train was discontinued shortly after we arrived, but now we need to bring back rail distribution of staple foods. And there's no reason why we can't do that. We may even have to rebuild some railways. One of the railways that needs putting back, which Beeching took out, was the North-South Wales link. And that way we could get food from these rural areas where they are relatively depopulated and have a net surplus production of food uh, into, the, uh, into the urban areas. Another feature of my farm, which I didn't mention, was energy. We're on a renewable energy journey. We put in a ground source heat pump. We have a solar PV cell on the cheese dairy roof, which is the other side of the south facing side of the building behind myself and Sam. And we're looking at a turbine and a methane digester on the slurry store of our cows. And our aim will be not only to be completely self-sufficient in energy, but to be a net exporter. Uh, because farms will be the places where renewable energy will be produced in the future. The story of uh, Sam is an interesting one. He went to London, did a degree, ended up with a job uh, in a corporate ID firm in London. And then when he was 30 years old, I asked him a question for the first time in his life, which was, would you like to come back and work on the farm? Um, this was because there were a bunch of cheesemakers visiting the farm at that time. And uh, he happened to be there. And I'd never thought of inviting him to come back to the farm because a career in agriculture and on the land is not very sort of um, cool for young people these days. But to my great surprise, he said yes. And five years later, seven years later now, He's now turning all our milk into uh, cheese, which is on sale in Neil's Yard Dairy, Waitrose, and other good food retail outlets. Um, and th there's an interesting paradox about that is that I just refer to the need to relocalize food production and distribution. But because we are producing an artisanal cheddar on a small scale, the price we need to get for it at the farm, which is around £9.50 a kilo, is higher than the block industrial cheddar produced by a large-scale cheese factory and that's because of the lack of failure to cost internalize that I referred to earlier. So in order to remain viable, we're having to sell our cheese quite long distances away from the farm, going into Waitrose, going into Neil's Yard Dairy and some that's even being exported to America. Now, I'm not advocating that as a sustainability strategy, I'm simply uh, for the early adopters who try to make farming systems viable ahead of the curve of the economic advantage uh, you, you either have to have a day job or you have to rely on the market, and I'm relying on both at the moment. The resilience factor I've already touched on, that's one of the things that I've learned. Uh, the economic viability I've just referred to. So what we need is enabling policy instruments 
which, which I believe is one of the priorities to design at the moment, where we can make sure that doing the right thing is rewarded economically. And when that happens, as is happening with renewable energy, sustainable food systems will be able to break through towards the mainstream. And then there's the question of scale. There's a big a debate going on on the arches at the moment about Brian Aldridge and his super dairy. Um, I believe that the maximum size of a dairy herd ought to be defined by the distance that the cows in that herd can walk to grass and back again to the milking parlour twice a day and be fed on freshly grazed grass. Um, for a farm steading in the middle of an area of land as mine is, that maximum herd size would probably be 300 or so. And after that, you simply cannot walk the cows far enough and back in a day to graze the grass um, without wearing the cows out. And um, if you go over that, if you get up to 1,000 cows or 1,500 cows or whatever it is that the average unit is going to be, there's no way those cows can walk to grass. So you end up housing them and you have cow hospitals and then they're even claiming that the, um, uh, the emissions are better uh, for very large animal industrial units. And I'm absolutely certain that the maths is wrong on that. We have to get, uh, get underneath that. But even if the maths was right, which I'm certain it isn't, it's not the right thing to do because it's no, not the right way to treat animals and it's not truly sustainable. So the, the question of right scale is a very important issue for the future of agriculture. I'm not personally down on very large units, but they have to, they have to work ecologically and that's one of the things we have to deal with. The final issue that, uh, that I've come to see from my farming experience is the cultural dimension. Uh, the fact that my son came back is very important to me, obviously, and I believe that we have to attract the next generation back onto the land if we're going to uh, tackle the challenges that I've outlined in my talk. And I'd like to end on what um, my new organisation, the Sustainable Food Trust, uh, is doing to address these challenges. The organisation emerged as a result of a series of meetings between leaders of the food movement internationally that were convened in 2010 where a consensus emerged that for all the good work that I described earlier that the food movement has been doing, we haven't broken through into the mainstream. And in part, that was because we weren't communicating effectively. We needed to be more cohesive. We needed to collaborate better, which of course is the case with big, the big food industry um, and the major players who are uh, largely controlling things as they are. And we concluded that only through uh, a much greater level of collaboration, not just in this country, but throughout the world, would it be possible to be more effective in bringing about the conditions for this radical transformation of our food system which are needed. And as a result of that, uh, the plans developed to, to, to um, launch the Sustainable Food Trust. Our website is going to be going live next week. Um, we have an international board. We have some core funding. We're working very we're working all over the world, but particularly we've built very strong links with America. And I'll just end by describing one or two of the projects that we've got uh, in hand. Uh, we aim to bring together research institutes uh, from many different countries to embark upon the process of quantifying the external costs of the present system and developing policy instruments which will internalize those costs uh, or tax them at source, um, and it could be either carrots or sticks. We need to either penalize damaging practices or reward beneficial practices. In fact, we need both, but we also need policy instruments to do them, rather like the feed-in tariffs. So we need to do for food what has already happened for renewable energy. We need to influence high-level thinkers and strategists on agriculture globally, including big foundations, we're convening a, a meeting an, of international foundations at the end of June, which is bringing together for the very first time in the world the largest foundations, many of whom are based in America, who are already supporting sustainable agriculture, but who, are, again, are not communicating with each other effectively and are working in silos. So we need to break down this silo mentality. We need to communicate the results as effectively as possible both of the damaging consequences of the present industrial food system, but also the beneficial outcomes of the sustainable alternative. Because if we can do that, then we will harness the power of public opinion, which will be the only way in which we will persuade politicians, including our government, to adopt some of the practices I've been advocating.
And finally, and I think almost more important than anything else, we need to enable ordinary citizens to understand these issues and feel connected with them. Because I think it's certainly speaking from my own point of view, to understand this, the complexities of the current globalized food system and to know what you might be able to do about it, let alone to know how your voice and how your tiny action as a consumer or growing your own food in your garden could make a difference is beyond most people's ken. And we somehow need to make these ideas and these issues accessible and understandable uh, to as many people as possible. Um, that we hope we will do virally through our website and through uh, communicating with people on their own level, getting, taking the jargon out of it and making, make, making them realize that actually this process of transformation is much more likely to happen from the ground up than from the top down. And in fact, the two aren't mutually exclusive. The enabling conditions for top down change will be a groundswell of informed public opinion of people who aren't going to wait for governments to act, but actually will be the change themselves. And their collective influence will then bear down on governments. So that's a, a very brief summary of the agenda for the Sustainable Food Trust. I think I've run out of time. I have. I'll stop there. Yes. I mean, you sort of been a trailblazer, if you like, for people who are trying to do something about climate change, because you are having to fundamentally alter people's perception of how they, what they eat, and how they get onto their plate. Whereas people who are campaigning on climate change have got an even bigger agenda, which is how they live their lifestyles and why they go around the cars and all the rest of it. So. The Soil Association has been in existence for how long? Since 1946. Yeah. So we need to speed things up a bit with climate change because we can't afford to wait for 50 years because it will all be all it will be game over by then and climate change will be completely reversible. So what have you learned from your years of experience that you can now advise climate change campaigners to speed up the process of changing public opinion? Well, I just go back to the point I made earlier, that if you're looking for low-hanging fruit and making a difference to climate change, start with food. If, if it's right that this latest research shows that 50% of total emissions are directly or indirectly related to our food systems, and as I also said, the reinstatement of uh, soil, the soil carbon bank can be uh, uh, achieved relatively quickly, then actually that ought to be the number one focus of people who are concerned about climate change, not about fifth on the list or hardly featuring, which is the case at the moment in terms of the media debate and the political debate. So that's one thing I'd say. But the other thing I'd say is that if one is talking about movements for change, I think in the past, and this is a movement that I've been part of during the 80s and 90s and early noughties, there's been a tendency to demonize the existing status quo as being somehow beyond the pale and really bad people. And I think we, that now has to change because in the, in the old days it was perhaps slightly self-indulgent amongst those of us that were campaigning in the environmental movement to, to, to polarize the debate between the bad guys and the good guys. Now I think we, we, we no longer have that luxury. We're, we're all confronted with irreversible and potentially catastrophic ecological events if we don't change the whole of our food systems or the whole of our practices. And against that backdrop, we have to have a much more inclusive attitude. We must work together. We must reach out to the people with whom we've been having this polarized debate in the past and say, let's form commissions of experts. Let's redesign our food systems. Let's have government appointed or maybe self-appointing, self-emerging food commissions that start to replan the route map from where we are now, highly unsustainable, centralized, industrialized, towards relocalized, healthy, soil regenerative, and truly sustainable systems. So I think that uh, that's one issue. The, another issue would be the power of the individual and the power of viral communications and the power of the internet. I think that's, all those things are ground for hope. I think millions of young people already get this stuff. They get it intuitively. They've sort of had some sort of osmotic, osmotic acquisition of some of this knowledge from their parents. Uh, because we are the binge generation. We the, we're the people who left the planet in such a dreadful state for our children. But they already know this. 
so we can assume that they will pick up this knowledge in the way that they do, which is quite different from the way we did when we were young, uh, very quickly and act on it quite quickly too. And I also believe in the tipping point theory that when you get to 5%, especially since the 5% tend to be the forward thinkers, you can have a very rapid uh, Arab Spring type change of um, acceleration of uh, public attitudes. And one of the things that came out on Wednesday, someone talked about a guy called Craig Sands. He was born in Nebraska. And he said when his great-grandfather first started to plow soil, the carbon content was 100 grams of carbon per kilogram of soil. Now, as a result of modern intensive agricultural practices down to farms. And his, his business is putting carbon back into the soil through biochar, which you may know about. I do know about biochar, and I had the uh, very interesting experience of driving right across the Midwest of America last September between Chicago and Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and I'd heard that the Midwest of America was devoted to two primary staple crops, namely soy and um, maize or corn, uh, but I hadn't, o only experiencing it f at first hand gave me any idea of the sheer scale of it. I mean, the whole of that area of America is literally only producing two crops, Roundup Ready Soy and Roundup Ready Corn. And because of the uh, historic effectiveness of the Roundup, which is sprayed five or six times during the growing season of that crop, there was no other biodiversity. And that just in, the result of that is because uh, they're, they're, they're grown every year, is the soil organic matter level has dropped and dropped and dropped, as Craig Sands said. But also that in biodiversity terms, it's just an accident waiting to happen. And what of course is happening is that the weeds are now becoming resistant to Roundup. So now Monsanto and co are devising new um, genetically modified crops, which are resistant to even more toxic herbicides. So. We have to completely rethink our relationship with uh, the soil and with our natural environment. And one part of on, on that trip, I spent a bit of time in the combine of Howard Buffett, Warren Buffett's son. We had a very interesting conversation about, because he gets soil, uh, but we had a very interesting conversation about why he is unlikely to change until the policy instruments in the US Farm Bill change. And that is because he wants to farm as profitably as possible. And he can't grow a legume uh, after combining soy or corn because they both are harvested too late to establish a seedbed and get a, a fertility building legume crop in. And the farm bill rewards the soy and the corn producers more than anything else. So all the farmers in the Midwest are locked into a cycle where they de they're dependent on nitrogen fertilizer, etc., etc. This perhaps <laughs> comes on to the point you mentioned about abattoirs. <coughs> I sat on the House Lord Subcommittee a few years ago in which we had to consider the effect of the abattoir inspectors on abattoirs. <laughs> and it quickly became apparent to us that the enthusiasm of the inspector for the regulations that they had to impose was such that they actually preferred to close down small abattoirs where possible on the grounds that large abattoirs were easier to inspect. That's exactly right. <laughs> it's, it's, if you know something about what is going on in terms of the the unintended consequences partly supported by a vested interest of this, these centralized systems of slaughtering and meat packing. It is truly shaming that we are part of a society that's, that's, that's backing that. And the small abattoirs, you have to have a vet on duty the whole time. The regulatory burden and the cost of that regulatory burden bears disproportionately on those people. And as a result, uh, it's simply not possible for many of them to stay in business. And the supermarkets don't buy their meat even though their customers can't probably hope and vaguely wish that the meat was slaughtered locally. When in fact, you know, if you take, well, I won't name the supermarkets, but they're all the same. They've all got abattoirs which necessitate the animals that, get, that are slaughtered to travel up to eight hours to get to them. And they are industrial operations. They're wonderful for spreading germs, actually. So you need a very high system of regulatory control, because otherwise you've got like an airport for germs. Really. That's why we've got BSE in this country, because we had a highly centralized uh, cattle milling system. So when you had the infected agent, the animal protein in incorporated, it just got to all the dairy farms. So there was a massive public health incentive to relocalize our systems of killing animals and also milling foods. But that's not understood. The problem in this case is that these regulations came to the European Union and were seized upon 
by DEFRA, who seemed to be good at nothing but making more regulations. <laughs> so we had a system whereby <laughs> everybody to whom we spoke recognized that harm was being done because farmers couldn't get their stock to <laughs> the abattoirs and so on. So it affected the whole chain. <laughs> and yet, for the sake of the rules alone, the enthusiasm was to continue this project. Yes, I agree. Because it could be managed better, therefore it was yeah. better. Although everybody knew it was not. Well, one of the biggest problems is, one of the biggest barriers to change is that very few farmers are involved with uh, the processes, the committees, the commissions that oversee these things. And the reason I wanted to show those pictures of my farm is not just because I'm proud of it, which of course I am, but because I've derived more understanding of the nature of the barriers to the changes that we need to see from practical farming. I still milk cows every other weekend and I'm still very involved with my farm. I'm going back there now. And it's, you, it's impossible to fully understand what is needed in agriculture unless you have a degree of involvement with practice. And I'm not saying that all these commissions need to be populated exclusively by farmers. Of course they shouldn't. But they need to have a core of people with practical experience on them. Because then the, the farmers can make sure that the wrong things don't happen as you've described. Thank you. <laughs>